So good evening and welcome everyone to this online session on ASCO 2022 highlights in early stage lung cancer man management organized by Lung Cancer Europe. My name is uh, Alfonso Aguaron and I'll be moderating today's webinar. So today it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Yarus Kanaidu, a thoracic oncologist focused on immunotherapy for lung cancer and immune toxicity at, Be at Beaumont uh, RCSI Cancer Center in Dublin, as well as adjunct prof professor at John Hopkins University. So Dr. Naidu, I would like to thank you very much for your valuable uh, and precious time today to guide us through the latest news presented at the American Society of Clinical Coronary Annual Meeting that was held in, in Chicago last month especially when it comes to the latest research and discoveries in the management of, of early stage lung cancer. So um, before we get started, I would like to give our audience, all of you who are attending this webinar, a brief overview on the webinar dynamics. So the session will last uh, about an hour. And during uh, the first part, uh, Dr. Naidu will provide a, a comprehensive review on today's topic, which will last between 30 to 40 minutes approximately. And then in the second part, you will be able uh, to ask your questions. So to do so, you have two ways. If you'd like to make your questions live by using your microphone, you just have to press the raise hand uh, button on the bottom part of your screen, and I'll mute you when it is your turn. Or if you present your you send your questions in writing, please do so by writing them in the Q&A or in the chat window, and I'll then pass them to Dr. Naidu. Also, uh, you have the chance to enable the live transcription in the bottom bar, so you can read the automatically generated subtitles of the webinar. So being said that, and without uh, any further ado, I wish you all a very fruitful session. And Dr. Nidu, I, I give you the floor. Thanks so much for the kind invitation. It's a, a pleasure and privilege to present on this topic um, and to, of course, the most important people in the room, uh, those uh, who hopefully will benefit from some of these advances. So today I um, am pleased to present on early stage lung cancer and some of the highlights from ASCO 2020. So this is the current treatment landscape for patients with non-small cell lung cancer, early stage disease, uh, those without a driver mutation, who we now consistently um, appreciate should be treated in a slightly different manner. So in patients with newly diagnosed non-small cell lung cancer, this is separated into patients with earlier stage disease, which is defined as stage one or two, uh, locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer stage three, and advanced non-small cell lung cancer stage four. And we see here for the portion of today's discussion that we're going to focus on early stage and locally advanced, which usually collectively is known as earlier stage. And for many years, the standard of care for early stage, meaning one and two, and a certain portion of stage three lung cancer was treated as resectable disease. Um, and then a subset of patients with stage three non-small cell lung cancer is deemed unresectable or unable to undergo surgery. So this is kind of how we separate these uh, subclassifications of early stage lung cancer. So focusing first on resectable non-small cell lung cancer, I'll go through three high level clinical trials that um, are moving us towards a more refined approach for this section of lung cancer. The first two studies are, um, are updates on either some new data or refinement of data on a neoadjuvant approach. So giving upfront uh, treatments in the form of chemotherapy and immunotherapy before surgery in patients with earlier stage lung cancer. And this is really a model that was pioneered by our colleagues in breast cancer and now is, um, is sort of a new area of growth and scientific and clinical interest in patients with earlier stage lung cancer. Then we'll also have an update on, um, on the PEARL study. So this study um, aimed at identifying the potential benefit of immunotherapy after surgery. So again, in earlier stage lung cancer, we can also treat patients with upfront surgery. And now this study aims to identify the potential benefit of immunotherapy after surgery. Uh, the second half of the talk will focus on that part of earlier stage lung cancer 
which is not deemed to be surgically operable. Um, and there are three updates in, in this regard. The first is um, a paper specifically uh, looking at a subset of patients with certain type of lung cancer um, who are treated with combination chemotherapy, radiation, and immunotherapy, part of this sort of pioneering trial called Pacific. And then two other studies that are aiming to give us new information of how we can do better beyond the Pacific trial, which gave uh, uh, immunotherapy with the drug Dovalumab. Um, and this, these two studies aim to, aiming to give immunotherapy in slightly different configurations or different um, types of medications combinations. So moving first to earlier stage resectables, so surgically treated non-small cell lung cancer, one of the major studies and advances uh, of this year is the Checkmate 816 study. And this is a phase three study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by my colleague, Dr. Patrick Ford, earlier this year. And in the study, patients with surgically resectable stage 1b to 3a non-small cell lung cancer that did not harbor a mutation in the in either EGFR or ALK, um, these patients were treated with either chemotherapy alone, which would represent a standard approach, or with the addition of immunotherapy with the, the medication nivolumab with chemotherapy. Patients received three cycles of either approach of treatment. They then went on to have surgery and had the option of getting chemotherapy with or without radiation on the back end. The primary endpoint or the primary outcome measure of the study was to try to identify if there was a benefit in uh, an outcome called event-free survival. And broadly, this study demonstrated that patients who got the, the addition of the immunotherapy to chemotherapy had a benefit in this um, type of survival endpoint, and also a benefit in something called pathologic complete response, which means complete disappearance of the tumor in the surgical resection specimen. What we saw at ASCO this year was some updates on this study. Um, and in these updates, um, further analyses were done to try to associate these two endpoints. So if patients um, were to experience, for example, this complete disappearance of the tumor in the surgical resection, did this mean that they were more likely to have a better survival, which was measured by this endpoint called event-free survival? And broadly, we see that this was true, both for patients who received, who achieved a pathologic complete response when they were treated with either the immunotherapy and chemotherapy combination or with chemotherapy alone. Um, however, we see that there were relatively few numbers of patients who achieved a pathologic complete response when they were treated with chemotherapy alone, as opposed to 46 patients who were treated with the combination who achieved this. Um, but really here quite um, what appeared to be a robust association between these two endpoints. Another very important piece of information that was presented at ASCO, again, giving us more information about how the surgical specimen looks and what this may tell us about how a patient may do with this approach, um, was an analysis uh, looking at something called residual viable tumor. So what proportion of, of um, active tumor in the surgical specimen associates with outcome. And what we see here is that with less and less viable tumor, patients appear to be doing better in terms of their, um, their outcome or their survival outcome, which in this study was measured as event-free survival. So taken together, the conclusions were that in patients with resectable stage 1b to 3a non-small cell lung cancer, the combination of immunotherapy and chemotherapy with the drug nivolumab was associated with an improvement in event-free survival in patients who achieved a pathologic response. Additionally, the depth of the pathologic response appeared to be predictive of an improved event-free survival at two years. So really some very interesting data that may help us to refine our approach in those who are treated with this, um, with this uh, type of treatment. A second study which was very much of interest was presented in one of the oral abstract sessions, and this study is really another variation of giving immunotherapy and chemotherapy upfront before surgery in patients with earlier stage non-small cell lung cancer. So this study, which was um, presented by the, uh, the Spanish um, oncology group called Nadine 2, builds on a previous study called Nadine. And in this study, patients received a similar combination, so immunotherapy with nivolumab 
and uh, chemotherapy, but this time the chemotherapy was mandated to be a specific chemotherapy regimen called carboplatin and paclitaxel. And in this study, patients received either chemotherapy alone or the combination, three cycles, followed by surgery. But in the group where patients received the immunotherapy, they also received immunotherapy for six months after surgery. So that was a little bit different to the phase three study that was um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. What was also different about this study is that it was focused on patients with stage three non-small cell lung cancer. So this is a slightly more advanced stage of non-small cell lung cancer, and it included patients with stage three A and 3B non-small cell lung cancer, um, which uh, broadly means a group of patients in which um, there is either a larger tumor or a larger number of lymph nodes. And in the case of 3B, there may be some discussions as to which uh, patients may fit in terms of their suitability for surgical management. The primary endpoint of this study was, as per the previous analysis, this uh, achievement of pathologic complete response or disappearance of the tumor in the resection specimen. So in this study, we see um, that the average age of patients was in their 60s, about 30 to 45% of patients were female, most patients were former or current smokers, a small number were never smokers, the majority had a, a histologic type of lung cancer called adenocarcinoma, and again here we see from the staging classification that stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer is a very different disease in terms of the pattern of where it may be in the lungs, ranging anywhere from a very small tumor, T1 tumor with a larger number of lymph nodes in two disease, all the way to a very large tumor, a T4 tumor, but with a relatively small number or even no lymph nodes. So really taking home that stage three lung cancer is not really created equal and helping us to interpret these results. So what this study showed was that patients treated with the combination of upfront chemotherapy and immunotherapy appeared to have um, a greater rate of pathologic complete response compared to patients treated with chemotherapy alone. So 36.8% of patients achieved a pathologic complete response if they got immunotherapy with chemotherapy, as opposed to just 6.9% of patients who received chemotherapy alone. This split was also seen in terms of radiographic response. So based on imaging of patients, we see here that after the upfront immunotherapy and chemotherapy, 75.4% of patients appeared to have um, a, a, an objective response or a, a, a shrinkage of the tumor based on radiographic imaging compared to just 48.2% of patients who got chemotherapy alone. What was very interesting about this study and is similar to the previous study is that um, the tumor's expression of a marker called PDL1, which we know in patients with advanced disease tends to um, be linked to a greater likelihood of response to treatment. This pattern was seen in this study as well, in that patients who had um, PDL1 expression, um, at particularly those with a high PDL1 expression of greater than 50%, appeared to be more likely to achieve a pathologic complete response to treatment. Um, and we see this um, in, in both of these graphs here. Another very important question, obviously, when we analyze any new study is what are the side effects or toxicities from this approach? And broadly, we see here that while overall, there may be a high incidence of toxicities uh, in total with mild toxicities happening in a large proportion of patients, severe toxicities actually only occurred in a smaller number of patients, the most common of which was tiredness. So how do we place some of this in context? Like I said, in earlier stage lung cancer, the standard for many years was to do surgery first. So another um, area of potential innovation is to do surgery first, but then to, to do immunotherapy on the back end after surgery, which is called adjuvant therapy. And uh, we now have a new standard for adjuvant immunotherapy based on this clinical trial called EMPOWER10. So this study was actually published at ASCO last year and is now subsequently published um, in full. And in this study, patients with completely resected lung cancer received chemotherapy. And after that, um, they, they were compared or randomized to receive either immunotherapy for a year 
or observation. And the primary endpoint of this study was disease-free survival. Um, and it enrolled a large number of patients, over a thousand patients representing everywhere from stage 1B to 3 non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and the main goal was to assess whether there was a benefit in, in this uh, in patients with a PDL one greater than 1% non-small cell lung cancer, but was also tested in all comers in these populations. And what the study demonstrated demonstrated was that there appeared to be a benefit for this immunotherapy, atezolizumab, in all patients, regardless of stage, but that this was certainly uh, driven by patients who had pdl one positive non-small cell lung cancer um, with the greatest benefit seen in this population. And this is underscored in approval for, for this medication for patients with pdl one positive non-small cell lung cancer with a cutoff of 1% in, um, in America, but uh, a cutoff of 50% in Europe. Again, we see here that the side effect profile of this appears to be generally well tolerated with um, in only uh, 7 to 10% of patients getting a toxicity that was deemed to be severe, but of course something that we're always concerned about. So what was new at ASCO in this space? So there is another study exploring the use of immunotherapy after surgery called the PEARL study. Uh, the PEARL study was run as a, a collaboration between several European groups, including the EORTC and ETOP. And in this study, um, which was somewhat similar, but, but slightly different to the EMPOWER-10 uh, study, patients with earlier stage non-small cell lung cancer had surgery, um, any pd one expression um, was accepted, and patients received adjuvant chemotherapy, although this was not mandated, and they could uh, were then randomized to receive pembrolizumab, a different anti-PD-1, in this case, immunotherapy compared with placebo for a year. And in this particular uh, poster that was presented by Mary O'Brien, the purpose was to identify whether um, patients uh, had different outcomes based on the type of surgery they received, their disease burden, or the type of adjuvant chemotherapy they received. And in this um, uh, th this uh, forest plot of the different subgroup analyses, we see that consistently patients uh, did not appear to benefit specifically from any particular surgical approach. Um, there was no differences based on disease burden or the type of adjuvant chemotherapy that was received. So therefore, in summary, in early stage non-small cell lung cancer deemed resectable, the Nadeem 2 study identified that giving neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy with nivolumab and a chemotherapy called carboplatin and paclitaxel was superior to chemotherapy alone in stage 3A and B resectable non-small cell lung cancer, where the main endpoint was pathologic complete response. The Checkmate 816 study, the phase three study that examined the role of neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy with nivolumab was further interrogated this time, trying to understand the relationship between achieving a pathologic complete response and survival outcomes. And a, uh, a, an abstract presentation demonstrated that there is a correlation between achieving pathologic complete response, um, residual tumor volume, and outcome to treatment. In the adjuvant setting, the PEARL study demonstrated to us that adjuvant pembrolizumab may be of benefit to patients regardless of the type of surgery they receive, the chemotherapy they receive, or the size of their tumor. Now, what we will see, I think, in the future in this area is to define specifically which groups of patients with earlier stage non-small cell lung cancer may benefit from neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy versus chemotherapy alone in terms of stage. I think there will be a, there will be a great um, degree of interest um, and work done in trying to un understand whether pathologic complete response may be the best endpoint to help us assess the potential benefit of this approach. And of course, a major area of debate is whether it may be optimal for patients to receive immunotherapy either upfront before surgery or after surgery. And certainly the PEARL study and the EMPOWER10 study before it um, uh, solidifies that adjuvant immunotherapy may be a reasonable treatment option. So moving on to unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer, what is the current standard of care? So the current standard of care is the Pacific trial. So this was a, a practice changing trial for which we now have five year survival data. And this uh, aimed to assess the benefit of giving immunotherapy after definitive combined chemotherapy and radiation in patients with unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer. This study, um, 
as we see here, enrolled patients irrespective of their PDL1 status, and within 42 days of chemotherapy and radiation, patients were randomized to either receive immunotherapy with the agent Dovalimab, given every two weeks for a year, compared to placebo. And the primary endpoints of the, the study were overall survival and progression-free survival. And really, the study um, uh, really hitting a home run, showing um, an impressive benefit in terms of overall survival, with 42% of patients, 42.9% of patients alive at five years, compared to 33.4% of patients at five years. And this translated into a median overall survival of 47.5 months compared to 29.1 months. In terms of progression-free survival, um, again, we saw a benefit with, from adding Dovalimab with 33.1% of patients progression-free at five years, compared to 19% of patients who were treated with placebo after definitive chemotherapy and radiation. And this translated to a progression-free survival benefit with 16.9 months in those treated with Dovalimab, as opposed to 5.6 months in those treated with chemotherapy, radiation, and observation alone. The subgroup analyses, I think, are very important to look at when, um, when analyzing these data. So we see here that patients with um, oncogene-addicted lung cancers were able to enroll in the study. And uh, we see that patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer, there is a question as to whether they may benefit with um, the 95% um, the confidence interval crossing one for patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer in terms of both progression-free and overall survival. Another question is, is as to whether patients receiving Dovalimab should be based on tumoral PDL1 status. In the US, the approval for this agent is regardless of PDL1 status. And in Europe, this is based on a patient's tumor score um, being greater than uh, 1%. And we see here the data in support of that. So this question of whether there is a benefit for patients who receive immunotherapy for stage three EGFR mutant lung cancer has been assessed by several retrospective studies. A large study was published in the JTO last year examining 37 patients with stage three EGFR mutant lung cancer, 13 of which were treated with Dovalimab, 24 not. And in the study, we see that the median progression-free survival was 10.3 months with Dova, 6.9 months with chemo radiation. But in those patients who had some kind of targeted therapy in the setting, this was as high as 26.1 one months. Concerningly, a rate of high-grade immune-related toxicity was seen in these patients. 46.2% of them developed an immune-related toxicity, and 25% developed inflammation of the lungs called pneumonitis, which we know can occur as a synergistic toxicity or accumulative toxicity, taking into account that both immunotherapy and targeted therapy may cause pneumonitis, which is inflammation of the lungs. Uh, in the study, six patients had OC Mertinib, the um, T790M specific tyrosine kinase inhibitor at progression, and one patient had a high grade pneumonitis event. So I was very privileged to present in the poster session at ASCO this year, um, a poster that aimed to answer this question as to whether patients with EGFR mutant stage three non-small cell lung cancer may benefit from consolidation to a value map. So this is the, the EGFR mutant subset analysis from the Pacific trial. And unfortunately, since there was a small number of patients that who had EGFR mutant lung cancer enrolled in the study, we don't have a definitive answer here. But broadly, what we see was that there really was no statistically significant difference in either progression-free or overall survival in patients with EGFR mutant stage three lung cancer, where they, they were treated with dovalimab or placebo. And I think really some of these data potentially in the eye of the beholder, as some may interpret this as saying that dovalimab, um, it may not be wrong to necessarily give dovalimab in the setting, and others may interpret this to say that there is no clear benefit in giving dovalimab in the setting. So I think important for us to publish some of these prospective data, but I think future clinical trials such as the LORA trial are more likely to give us more instructive results. A very clear question, an important question here, which wasn't really answered by the ASCO presentation, was that if these patients receive a targeted therapy after immunotherapy, is this harmful? And in a, in a separate study, 
um, 15 uh, 15% of patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer treated with immunotherapy followed by targeted therapy for this type of disease developed high-grade immune-related toxicity. And this occurred more commonly when the targeted therapy was started within three months of immunotherapy as opposed to later in the treatment journey. Importantly, this only seemed to occur with the mutant-specific tyrosine kinase inhibitor and did not occur with other EGFR TKIs. So moving on to the last two um, clinical trials that were presented in the early stage setting at ASCO. Another clinical trial um, looking at um, a new immunotherapy approach in stage three non-small cell lung cancer was explored in the Keynote 799 study. And in this study, the hypothesis was that patients who receive immunotherapy together with chemotherapy and radiation may benefit in terms of their outcome as opposed to giving immunotherapy after chemotherapy and radiation. So in this study, which enrolled patients with stage three non-small cell lung cancer, patients could receive uh, immunotherapy with pembrolizumab together with chemotherapy, um, followed by immunotherapy maintenance, um, and that was cohort A. And the second um, cohort looked at a different chemotherapy with cisplatin and pemetrexid, and this enrolled patients with non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancers only. So really what was different about this compared to the Pacific trial was that immunotherapy was layered on to definitive chemoradiation, and different chemotherapy regimens were compared between cohort A and cohort B based on histology. The primary endpoints of the, the study were objective response rate and the incidence of grade three pneumonitis. And we see that in, co in both cohort A and cohort B, the objective response rates were very similar at 70.5 and 70.6%, and that the incidence of high-grade pneumonitis was relatively low at seven to 8% in each cohort. We saw in the ASCO presentation this year, a two-year update on the Keynote 799 study in terms of both progression-free and overall survival. And really the take-home message here, I think, is that these data are very exciting and comparable to the data we see from the Pacific study with the median progression-free survival of 30.6 months in cohort A and not reached in cohort B, and the median overall survival not reached in either cohort A or B, but 64.3% of patients um, alive at two years compared to 71.2% of, uh, of patients alive at two years in cohort B. So very, very promising data um, and durable response and benefit seen in patients enrolled in the study. The last study I want to highlight is the BTCRC Lung 16081 study. So this study, which is run by the Hoosier Oncology Group in the US, aimed to identify if we can do something better beyond one immunotherapy drug in stage three non-small cell lung cancer. So this study presented by Dr. Derm and colleagues, we see here from the schema, patients received concurrent chemotherapy and radiation, and then within 56 days of treatment, depending on um, an end of treatment scan, those who achieved stable disease or a response to therapy were randomized to receive either immunotherapy alone with nivolumab or a combination of two immunotherapy drugs, nivolumab and ipilimumab. Here on the right, we see the baseline characteristics of the patients enrolled on the study. So 54 patients treated with nivolumab alone and 51 treated with the immunotherapy combination. Uh, roughly even split between males and females in both groups. Um, we see here a roughly even split between stage 3A and stage 3B, non-small cell lung cancer, but a slightly higher rate of stage 3A. And that patients received a range of chemotherapy agents together with radiation, but that the most common chemotherapy combination to be given was carboplatin and paclitaxel. The results here, we see um, the primary endpoint of the study was the 18-month progression-free survival. Um, and we see here that the median progression-free survival was 25.8 months for nivolumab alone and 25.4 months for the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab. In terms of overall survival, the median overall survival was not reached in either case, but the two-year overall survival was 77.7 in uh, for nivolumab alone and 80.6 in nivolumab, the nivolumab and ipilimumab combination. 
In terms of toxicity, we did see a relatively high rate of toxicity with 72.2% of patients um, having a treatment-related side effect when treated with nivolumab, and 80% of those are treated with a combination. But when we delve deeply into this, we see that the toxicities associated with the combination are, are relatively high, but potentially what we expect to see with this, 52.9% of patients having a severe toxicity, the most common of which, which was anticipated, was inflammation of the lungs, with an incidence of grade two pneumonitis, particularly in the combination arm of 31.4%, high grade events happening in 17.6% um, of patients, and the median time to symptomatic pneumonitis of about seven months. So therefore, in summary, what are the key findings for stage three unresectable non-small cell lung cancer? So based on the Pacific trial, there does not appear to be a difference in terms of progression-free or overall survival, where the patients received a valimab or were simply observed if they have EGFR mutant stage three non-small cell lung cancer. Some newer methods to potentially bring the field forward in stage three non-small cell lung cancer is to give immunotherapy concurrently with chemotherapy and radiation. And this appears to be promising in terms of progression-free and overall survival and a tolerable approach. Can we do better even beyond this? The combination of two immunotherapy drugs after definitive chemo radiation may be, uh, does look promising. However, there are high rates of immunotherapy toxicity. Importantly, in this study, six months of immunotherapy was given as opposed to one year. And this does raise the possibility that six months may be enough, but further studies need to be done to understand the duration or optimal duration of immunotherapy, particularly in different settings of non-small cell lung cancer. So I think some of the debates and questions that are sparked from these research studies will be to identify the optimum duration of immunotherapy in stage three non-small cell lung cancer, to define whether it may be optimal to give immunotherapy as consolidation, meaning after chemotherapy and radiation, or whether we should consider giving it concurrently as well. And then particularly based uh, in oncogene addicted subsets of lung cancer, um, we need to be vigilant about the toxicities of immunotherapy, uh, either during or after treatment, particularly in those with oncogene addicted non-small cell lung cancers. So with that, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues and collaborators who've um, helped with this work and other work. And of course, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadu. I think you have uh, summarized uh, uh, very, very well all, all these uh, exciting news and uh, the progress that has been presented at ASCO. We have been receiving some some questions uh, in variety and also in our social media channels. This is the first time that we're using this new Zoom webinar technology. So we are streaming also live in, in Facebook, Twitter, and so on. So we have a few questions before I pass some of them. I would like to remind you all that you have two ways to, to send your questions. You the, use the Q&A uh, of the chat window or just press the raise hand button and I will unmute you. So I'm going with the first question, Dr. Medu, which says, uh, do you think surgery will play a secondary role in the future when it comes to treat a stage one, stage two lung cancer in favor of using immunotherapy plus chemo? No. Um, so I don't think that that um, that surgery will play a secondary role. I think what we have to do is define when surgery should happen in terms of timing. Should surgery happen first or should surgery happen after immunotherapy? I don't think any of these studies thus far are aiming to eliminate surgery. Um, that has been an established standard for many years. Um, I'm assuming as well that this may come from some exciting data around immunotherapy and rectal cancer and MSI high rectal cancer, in which some of these patients had a complete response in a tumor type in which surgery was done, a particularly morbid surgery. But so far, these data have not examined uh, whether surgery can be eliminated, and certainly that wouldn't be how I would interpret the data currently. Okay, thanks for your answer. Um, uh, we have another question here, which has been very recurring in some of our webinars, uh, which is about small cell lung cancer. And, and the question is, were there any news regarding the management of earlier stage uh, small cell lung cancer presented at ASCO? 
Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So, so as we know, limited stage small cell lung cancers or small cell lung cancer in general is very different to non-small cell lung cancer. So this is a cancer that we know can be sometimes a little bit more difficult to treat, has had less advances over the years. Um, about um, a smaller proportion of patients have limited stage small cell lung cancer, which is uh, based in the chest only. And for many years, this was treated with a combination of chemotherapy and radiation. Nothing specifically new in the space, but one of a, a very important clinical trial uh, run through the NRG called LU005 is examining the role of giving atezolizumab, which is an anti pdl one immunotherapy after definitive chemo radiation for limited stage small cell. So that's basically the, the Pacific trial for limited stage small cell. And that study has completely accrued. Um, so we would anticipate to see the results of that study very shortly. And I think is going to be um, a, a study that gives us a lot of information and maybe some of the first um, uh, information in limited stage small cell lung cancer for a long time. Great, interesting. And so thank you very much. I still have a few questions here. Um, the next one says, based on some reports, we know that around over 50% of patients are still diagnosed in advanced stage of progression. So has this been discussed at ASCO in how the number of patients diagnosed earlier can be improved? It's probably... Yeah, that, that, that's, I suppose that's, um, that might be a lung cancer screening question. So we know that um, right now, there, the, the issue or the question of lung cancer screening is being debated in Europe. Um, lung cancer screening is something that happens in the US and there are certain parameters that are used to select for patients who are at risk for the development of lung cancer based on age and based on the number of years uh, uh, and number of packs of cigarettes smoked. Um, and we know that doing lung cancer screening can reduce mortality based on two very large, well-conducted studies, um, one called the NLST and one called Nelson. So um, it is currently being debated as to how lung cancer screening can be implemented in an optimal fashion across different jurisdictions. And I guess that would be the goal of lung cancer screening would be to identify lung cancer early um, and give us a chance to, to treat it in an earlier stage setting um, before it has an opportunity to, to metastasize. Having said that, we know that lung cancer, unfortunately, is a cancer that does tend to, to grow more rapidly than others. And this may be another reason that contributes to the fact that patients, uh, when they present, might have advanced disease. Often, uh, by the time a patient has a symptom, they have advanced disease. So often, it, it's the nature of the cancer rather than um, you know, ne necessarily the ability to detect it early. Um, but hopefully, lung cancer screening will, um, will help to bridge that gap. Totally a challenge, and uh, I hope that in the future we'll see that the screening programs are more systematically uh, applied. So, um, next question. Yes, let me check here. Yeah, um, the next question says given the side effects of uh, chemo, is it possible to think in single immunotherapy for the treatment of certain types of early stage known as small cell lung cancer? Yeah, so that's that's a very good point. So um, for early stage lung cancer currently, um, based on the Empower 10 study, which I showed you, patients in an ideal world would get chemotherapy followed by immunotherapy in some instances. Um, and that's because, or how that study, that study was designed that way because we know that chemotherapy confers a survival benefit in some patients. Now it's not a extremely impressive survival benefit, but it's a benefit nonetheless. In the PEARL study, the use of chemotherapy was not mandated. So not everybody had chemotherapy in that instance, but neither of these studies have really examined whether we can dispense with chemotherapy and give immunotherapy instead. Um, and I guess that might be a study question for the future um, as to which patient population that might be to inform that approach. Um, 
the I guess the pros and cons in relation to chemotherapy is that adjuvant chemotherapy usually is only for three months. So even if a patient develops a toxicity, that toxicity is likely to improve or resolve because it is not lifelong therapy. Um, so that may be another argument for, for giving the chemotherapy, particularly when we know it does improve survival. So I think there are pros and cons in that regard. Thank you so much for your answer. We still have like uh, one, two, three more questions. So the next one uh, says, are these presented uh, results being already applied systematically in national health systems, or there is a still a preference to pick reference centers when the, this type of diagnosis are found? Um, so, uh, can you repeat that, uh, the question? So, yeah, so it's like the, if these results that have been presented at ASCO are being systematically applied already, like these new discoveries, or is there still a preference to search for reference centers to treat this type of early stage diagnosis with these new developments or these new discoveries? Okay, so maybe just to take a step back there. So, the, so what's normally presented at the ASCO meeting is new data based on clinical trials. So when something, when we are trying to discover a new approach to try to improve outcomes for patients, we have to first identify whether there is a benefit and make sure that there is no harm based on a clinical trial result. And after that, that has to usually be verified and reviewed by what we call regulatory bodies, government bodies, insurance company, uh, there are different mechanisms in different countries before those treatments can then get to a patient. So even though we might complete a clinical trial or present some information, that information will not be immediately accessible or necessarily change our practice. Usually for something to be practice changing, it needs to be in a large phase three clinical trial and it needs to be approved for use through various mechanisms that are at play in different countries. So um, it, it isn't that these approaches will only be available in certain places. It's usually that clinical trials are usually only run in certain institutions, research institutions, and therefore patients who are getting those treatments in those institutions may have access to participating in those trials. But there is no guarantee that those trials will necessarily benefit that patient, and there is no guarantee that those results will be practice changing. So I hope that that helps to clarify that a little bit. Thank you so much. So we have the last two questions here in the chat. So the next one says, uh, well, first, it's a great presentation. In your practice, do you do you test all uh, non-small cell lung cancer stage three? Any safety or efficacy immunotherapy consolidation data with other target form mutations besides EGFR and ALK? So that's a very, very good question. So this um, question of testing for molecular alterations in stage three, I think is, is a relatively new, um, uh, new question. So we weren't testing until recently because it didn't necessarily change our management. But now there is an increasing question as to whether these patients who have this type of mutated lung cancer necessarily benefit. So in this instance, Usually we certainly ask for EGFR and ALK to be annotated um, in those patients, but doing a full next generation sequencing panel for all of these mutations is not yet considered standard in some jurisdictions. Certainly in the US, it may be done in certain instances and may not be done in others. And that is true of Europe as well. Thank you so much. So we have a last question, but just in case we, we still have some time. So if anyone else would like to, to make the question, remember you can uh, type it in the chat, the Q&A, or just send your, um, your, uh, your just raise your, your hand and I will unmute you. So the question says, would you take into consideration commutations such as SDK11 or TP53 in, neo, in neoadjuvant immunotherapy plus chemo or adjuvant immunotherapy scenarios? 
Yeah, that's that's another great question. So, um, you know, the, the question is highlighting the fact that there is new data to suggest that patients with certain um, types of mutations called co-mutations that can occur with KRAS mutations called STK11, P53, may imply different um, responses or likelihood of response to immunotherapy. So, so far that I have seen, these markers definitely look like they are likely to be of importance in the future, but have not yet been validated, meaning they have not been shown consistently across many studies to have an association with non-response, and they haven't been confirmed in a prospective manner. So um, I, I would not, while I, I might have that information, that would not change my management currently. Good, we have received another question. Uh, last minute one. So it says we are seeing more surgical patients present during follow up with second or even third primary line cancers and considered for further surgery. Are there any developments or thoughts regarding management of multiple primaries? Yeah, that, that's good. Great. Uh, it's a great question. It's sort of sep a little bit separate to this. So um, I think the question of multiple primaries, there's been a couple of studies aiming to identify if there are unifying genomic features that may help to distinguish whether somebody has a second primary or whether they have a recurrent um, lung cancer. Um, because this is still a relatively uncommon um, occurrence, I'm not aware of any specific developments or specific trials for this circumstance. And usually how we think about this is um, more from a, in a practical standpoint, can a patient be cured by having an additional surgery or an additional type of SBRT high dose radiation? And we adopt an approach that tries to ensure the best outcome for the patient um, rather than necessarily thinking about investigational approaches. Patients with second primary lung cancers or or potential second primary lung cancers are often excluded from clinical trials because um, they, they are such a unique group. But uh, the questioner brings up a good point, and perhaps this is a group that deserves their own studies. Great. It seems people are cheering up now uh, as we receive two questions in the meantime. So uh, the next one says, uh, what is the preferred treatment approach after progression on adjuvant immunotherapy? Do we need uh, to rebiopsy metastasis upon PD? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is a very tough situation to be in when a patient uh, develops progressive disease on adjuvant immunotherapy. Um, so in terms of what to do next, often we decide based on what we call the treatment-free interval. How long has it been since the patient received chemotherapy? And usually if it's after a significant amount of time, usually around six months, we may consider re-challenging with the same chemotherapy that the patient received previously or we may switch to a different type of chemotherapy approach, such as docetaxel or docetaxel ramacirumab. Um, oftentimes, of course, fundam fundamental principles, we must make sure that we have done comprehensive genomic testing. And if there is an oncogenic driver mutation, then giving a targeted therapy would usually be preferred depending on what alteration is found and availability um, in that area. In terms of biopsy at progression, so this is something that we do in patients with driver mutated non-small cell lung cancer in general, not all, but in general. And the reason why we do that, particularly for patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer, is because identifying the mechanism of resistance may, treat, may refine our treatment approach. So we know that a small proportion of patients may develop what is called small cell transformation where their non-small cell lung cancer transforms into small cell lung cancer. And this implies giving a certain type of chemotherapy as opposed to other types of chemotherapy or other targeted therapies. Unfortunately, so far that we know, the same is not true of immunotherapy. While there have been a lot of studies of doing biopsies at progression to inform mechanisms of resistance to immunotherapy, those studies have not yet yielded um, results that will guide how we pick our next treatment. So that is not something that is done as standard to, to guide clinical decision-making at present. 
Thank you, Dr. Medu. And the last question we're receiving so far is uh, for your patient with 3A, 3A stage 9 cancer, EGFR ALK negative, ECOG1 and resectable. Uh, do you start with CCRT and then based on PDL1 positivity, continue with immunotherapy mono? And how long? Yes, that's, that would be the Pacific regimen. So it's not continue with immuno, it's start immuno. So I would give a patient definitive chemotherapy and radiation. Then usually after that is finished, um, I do a CAT scan to make sure there has been no progression. And then I would start single agent immunotherapy. The recommendation would be to treat with that every two weeks for a year. And I would pretty much follow the clinical trial information to the letter. And um, I would only... Uh, stop it if the patient developed toxicity. Um, and I felt that it was a severe toxicity that required treatment discontinuation. If it's a mild toxicity, I might hold the immunotherapy, treat the toxicity, and aim to restart. Great, thank you. So I'm just checking, uh, but it seems there are no other questions. So with that uh, being said, we, we are going to close our session, but before that, Dr. Naidue, I would really like to thank you. Thank you again on behalf of Alliance Cancer Europe for, for such an understanding presentation and, and, and for your uh, willingness to answer all these, these questions. I'm pretty sure that our attendees have found this very, very interesting. And uh, I would also like to thank you all of our attendees for, uh, for being here today. Uh, I would like also to remind you that the full content of this session has been recorded and will be soon uploaded to our YouTube channel. So you can review it and share it uh, with the other patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals, and so on. And you will receive an email as soon as it is available. So you can watch it as many times as you wish. I would also take the chance to encourage you to follow up our upcoming um, activities in our new website, which is www.landcancereurope.eu, as well as to follow on our social media channels like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. So with that being said, uh, Dr. Nedu, thank you very much again for, for your time today. And I would like to wish you all a very fruitful evening. Looking forward to meeting you all our, in our upcoming activities. Uh, so nothing more to add. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thanks so much. Take care and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.